Um, generally, I get out and just drive around, or maybe I'm not. Maybe that wasn't my intent of that day. I'm going somewhere else, but mm -hmm. I am uh, looking off to the right or left a little bit as safely as I can. And early on in my own training, we were taught to look for basic geometric forms coming together in juxtaposed interesting positions, like a triangular shaped field coming into, you know, big tall cylindrical trees. Mm -hmm. uh, and then watch for just nice shapes coming together. And of course, some of it, you know, you can get out there and try and force yourself to see a scene. Mm -hmm. And then oftentimes we just, compositions when we're going down the road 60 miles an hour, wow, there it is. You see it all at once because mm -hmm. you've got that background in you for looking for uh, shapes, mm -hmm. forms. And, and so I'm looking for now, you know, a landscape that's going to give me a good foreground interest with a middle ground and background. Okay. Uh, so good. that you have like a stage, you're working these different planes. Yeah. And that allows you uh, not necessarily to interpret it exactly as it was, as you saw it, but you know, you know art is a thinking thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, move things a little bit if you need to. Uh, you don't want to divert too much from what the model is giving you, but if you want to push your sky colors a little bit, and, and you want to bring out the emphasis of the contrast of the main subject, whether it's just an old fallen tree, uh, in the middle ground, mm -hmm. or perhaps it's, it's a landscape uh, with cattle or something in the foreground and, and, and you, you want to play at the shadows of them and then have kind of a light uh, middle ground behind that and then your your third plane almost always serves as kind of like a back cloth that you would use in, in still life painting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's to benefit what's going on in those first two stages in a mm -hmm. way. But it, it is very important. Every part of your 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 format of your canvas, in other words, is just as important as any other because okay. what you do in this square inch up here affects what you do down here. So it's all relative uh, in in making the composition all sing together and, and be poignant. Cool. I would say probably seventy five percent of the time of gathering information is a photograph quickly. Mm -hmm. That is uh, great for detail. But uh, I don't think it should replace the time of just planning to get on out there and do some plain air painting right on location of subjects, mm -hmm. uh, sketching perhaps first, doing a value study of what you're looking at, mm -hmm. even in pencil or charcoal in a small format, mm -hmm. and then um, taking it directly to the canvas. If I'm working out of doors on plain air, I generally am not working too large, and I'm trying to use a fairly large brush so that I can go ahead and, and capture something within about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. That may further be brought to the studio, enlarged, take my photograph I took of it, because, you know, the photograph is a little bit distorted oftentimes. It, it, it's not perhaps the true color that was there. Uh, it also, you know, tends to scrunch things down mm -hmm. in the perspective and in the distance, and so it's not real, real time, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and so, I, I do, I do use photographs, but it's also backed up with the experience of having actually been there. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is in our modern world, it is hard to, to sometimes get out there as you would like. But uh, I think you can um, really enhance uh, your you know, your modern uh, technology use of it uh, by uh, not being afraid to use it, but. Also, don't forget to get out there with the real thing and study it, and then you, you modify it as you want to with your program that you're using uh, in ways that haven't been seen before. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so. Yeah, you know, I, I think early on as a, as, a, as a young person, even as a kid at five years old, mm -hmm. uh, we. We sometimes get in our own world and we really draw honestly what we want to build and, we, and we, in a way we might tend to control our environment by what we image mm -hmm. in our pictures. Uh, little boys, it seems to often be war and battles and monsters and things. Yeah. Uh, and what little girls do may be different, may be similar, I don't know. Um, but uh, um, I think early on we are shaped a little bit of even where we live in our life. Uh, I. As I look back, as, even as a little kid, I like to just get off in the woods and 
and dig into creek banks and mm -hmm. the dirt and climb trees and stuff. Mm -hmm. So later on, I really, that's even though I do the figure oftentimes maybe in commissions, murals or whatever, mm -hmm. I return to the landscape because it's probably just almost in my blood. And also, for me particularly, I think growing up in a Protestant home, landscape painting is accepted mm -hmm. earlier on from the, the Protestant Dutch, mm -hmm. that this is an okay thing to paint. Uh, in fact, it is very expressive of the beauty of God's creation, mm -hmm. which in itself is not bad or sinful in any way, that it's, it's, it's all pure in essence. So the books we might have at home may be a book on John Constable, may a book on, uh, they might have a little print of a picture that my parents had cut out of a Jacob on Risedale, mm -hmm. or even a Rembrandt uh, scene. Uh, and so those, those, those landscapes are, are very much epitomize almost a religious belief that the landscape is, is God's pure creation mm -hmm. and he can often be in the golden light you may put it may even be the presence almost of God mm -hmm. in the landscape so uh, it's hard to not separate your, your religious or spiritual ideas about your uh, in from your landscape and what you say about mm -hmm. it Well, one thing I think right off is we think about even the, using the, the mechanical tool of a camera. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we've found that oftentimes uh, if, if, if the camera is not a really good quality or you don't really know how to use it, you'll have a, your sky will be, you know, mm -hmm. uh, too pale and, and, the, and the, you may be seeing the sh uh, shadow patterns in the shadows, but you won't have any sky left. Mm -hmm. and then. On the other hand, if you shoot and you get a good strong sky, then you have you've silhouetted shadow patterns and you have no shadow detail. So that's one thing you would pick up and want to realize, well, I've been out there and I know it should be this. And let me take a note of that while I'm shooting this picture, that this may happen. Mm -hmm. And then this may happen in the shadow and this is what I see while I'm here. And then you will learn to adjust those. Mm -hmm. um, but as I was reading the other day, it, it's fun sometimes to just do something totally off the wall and uh, instead of painting the sky blue paint it green and see what there is and paint the ground red or something mm -hmm. uh, just to, to experiment it may not be something you'll go ahead and mark it but to realize that um, if we know the principle that if red is there green is there and if we know purple is there then, then yellow is there mm -hmm. and we see that very uh, used over and over in, in uh, Van Gogh's paintings. He very much contrasted the compliments. Mm -hmm. Generally in the landscape, it's going to have a focus and it, it's, it's like giving a sermon almost or a speech. Everything else that you go out there with should almost turn, benefit what the focus was. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and um, so you don't want to, earlier on in my own painting and study, I tend to have, a, you know, ten paintings in one painting. And the teacher would say, well, you get too many paintings in one painting. What is your focus for this one? Mm -hmm. And we can get out there and tend to want to do everything mm -hmm. that's there. Uh, if that wasn't your intention, then you should do that. Mm -hmm. But generally, you want your public to, to be able to... It's, it's almost the simplest thing you can do that is not simple at all. Mm -hmm. It's actually very... Uh, a fine art piece um, will generally look quite magical Mm -hmm. to your public and, and be very pointed about its beauty and its statement and, and almost seems simple mm -hmm. but yet like the safety pin it's not simple at all. Mm -hmm. so it took uh, a creative thought and, and perhaps even an accident to mm -hmm. bring about that little form that does so much yeah. and uh, um, I've seen landscape painters that earlier on tried to paint every little detail they saw and then if you look at their work later on in life, they just totally started leaving out more and more, mm -hmm. getting more and more poignant about what they were trying to say. Mm -hmm. I would say some landscapes are more about color mm -hmm. uh, and then some of them are more about value change okay. with color. Uh, some of them are more linear in their structure. Some of them are more just shapes. Some of them are more all about recessional, you know, 
and, and but generally in a landscape you want to have planar change and you want to have recessional change. You want to show things getting smaller. You want to show over overlapping. You want to see uh, stronger values and colors coming to the light and to the foreground, mm -hmm. played against very soft and paler colors in the distance, which we know is aerial perspective. Mm -hmm. And as an artist, you can learn to push those more than you might have seen them there. Mm -hmm. So, as we say, you learn to paint from what you know and not necessarily what it's looking like. Okay. That doesn't mean you're closing your eyes and not looking at what's really yeah. there. Mm -hmm. It means you're looking at it, but looking at it with the purpose of making a great work of art. Okay. And, and it's not, unless you're wanting to be a photo realist, the goal is not necessarily then to see how well I can mimic the photograph. Because you can learn to master a photograph in a way, but um, I, I think the goal is that it, it's more—it makes a statement about something, but it is a work of art also. I, I've read about this, and I know a lot of different artists, whether oil painter, watercolor, or acrylic painter. Um, you want to have—it's uh, good to have two different blues, perhaps two different reds, two yellows, like a very cool blue perhaps a warmer blue. What would that be? Ultramarine blue, serene blue. Mm -hmm. You want to have like a warm yellow and a true yellow perhaps. And it, like a lemon yellow, and then maybe a cadmium yellow deep or something. Mm -hmm. you, the reds would be like cadmium red, or a red deep, or a Windsor red, which I like a lot. And then a cooler red, like a crimson red. Mm -hmm. uh, in acrylics it may be called archiviolet or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or quinacridone violet. And so forth in watercolor. Uh, that then that gives you good temperature on your color. The I like to have some earths over there, like sienna, oak, yellow ochre, and like a raw umber or burnt umber, mm -hmm. and then a big pile of white, and then if we want to put a little black over on the edge somewhere. But generally, that's a good palette because um, you you don't want to. As Dr. Gore and I have talked about, that you don't want to always have the same blue all in your sky. Okay. You want to have a variety of cool okay. and warm blue. Yeah. And uh, um, so that's the pattern I've been working of late. Now I train my students to try to work in complementary pairs, of okay. course, whether a violet or yellow. But anytime you paint like that, you're using the primaries, mm -hmm. and you can't paint really a three-dimensional true temperature painting without using the primary. In a design sense, uh, for designing wallpaper or something, you could work in just an analogous mm -hmm. color scheme, right, on one side. Uh, but as a painter, uh, the, in beautiful landscape, subtle color has to do with those semi-neutral colors that are found through mixing across in the wheel. Mm -hmm. Now, I've seen painters that work very bright in which they deal with all the cools and maybe all the warms right on the color wheel Mm -hmm. uh, um, bright, the brightest color you can use, and they, they just oppose those against each other. But I think some, to me, and this is a personal thing, the beautiful landscapes are the ones that have some of those pretty grays mm -hmm. in them, poetic. But if you want to do a wild or kind of brighter painting, then you might want to stay on the outside of the wheel just with the strong blues against mm -hmm. the strong reds and yellows. Um, but you can get too much out there and, and lose what you're doing. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost like a drummer trying to have too many snare drums out there that he can't ever get all the sticks over there yep. to ever hit them. Mm -hmm. And if he tried, he's going to flatten out his yep. sound. Okay. So you can flatten out your sound, so to speak, if you're losing your color mm -hmm. uh, mixing. Cool. Right. I usually keep the palette cleaned off in the middle. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I'll kind of just wipe that out uh, because um, that is your area to kind of start playing this. Because mm -hmm. the outside, that's just your supply, really. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cook talks about that. That's yeah. Out of the tube, that's your supply. Unless you're planning to paint bright. Yeah. Well, I don't know, uh, Ben, if I mentioned to you, but before, I, oftentimes all my students, I bring them to this thing called the Smather Seven Steps of mm -hmm. Painting. Okay. And number one, is what we started out with here is you got to go get an idea. Mm -hmm. You've you got to have a subject in life you're about. And, and in fact, as an artist that's going to make it in a, in a studio production, you, you need to have a theme to yourself and your work. And, mm -hmm. and 
find out what your voice is there. So for me, uh, it's to go get the idea. And sometimes that can be as much as going to a good museum and seeing a lot of visual things about other arts, then driving out into the field or going somewhere. And it just starts awakening this creative urge to, to, to do something yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you get an idea, and then I um, sketch it off. Uh, and oftentimes I could sketch that in charcoal or pencil. The reason I like charcoal and, and work fairly free and large is when I'm doing that, I'm not necessarily drawing with the charcoal, I'm kind of painting with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll drag it and I'll smooth it and, and make a value with it mm -hmm. quickly. So I feel like I'm just, I'm preparing to paint, I'm not preparing to do another finished drawing. Okay. So I draw that and then uh, I'll go in either, if, if it's, a, in a way, a little simplistic in that it's just a field going this and some trees here. I might can just take my brush right there and just brush on the canvas mm -hmm. and, and a line here and here and, and show myself where I want to go with this thing. Uh, however, what I usually do is it's involved enough in where I take my tracing paper and put over that charcoal drawing that I did very freely. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, I did the old trace transfer thing to my canvas. Okay. Now my canvas has probably already been primed mm -hmm. with a color that I know will go good with what I'm How do you determine do. that color? Uh, that color is through experience as to what colors I know will go well, but you know, generally in a landscape, if, if, if you look through everything, there's some color that permeates okay. everything there. Mm -hmm. uh, in certain times of year, you would expect. In the winter, you may have a great purple under things. Mm -hmm. In, in, in the fall, you may have more of a sienna under things. Mm -hmm. In the heat of summer, you may put more red to balance out the greens. Okay. So there's, there's, it's actually color theory choices there is about what colors will work with mm -hmm. this ground plane. Um, sometimes I've gone with directly with the trace drawing and then taking paint, usually acrylic because it dries in, and a liner brush and go over my drawing with mm -hmm. that paint, let it dry, and then brush off any charcoal. And then it's a white canvas with line. But then I tone over that. Mm -hmm. If I was an oil, I could go ahead and put a thin coat on that and mm -hmm. acrylic, I can thin coat. Uh, and, and then that's an uh, idea uh, transcribing the drawing to the canvas. The priming of the canvas has been done there also. Then you would want to block in with the largest brush you can. The, the statement there is that you want to, and I've read this from another artist, you want to use the largest brush you can as long as you can okay. so that you don't end up with little fussy strokes. Okay. So you, you want to think general to specific. You know, just like a sculpture may have a big stone from the quarry just dynamited out of there. Mm -hmm and then they'll um, start to take their bigger chisels and cut off the big parts and then they'll take the smaller chisels and then they'll take their detailed chisels and they'll take sandpaper mm -hmm. and polish the thing off or some type of polisher. Same way we're painting big brush, middle sized brushes, small detail mm -hmm. brush. Uh, because the reason for the big brush also is it lets you move more quickly, lets you be a little freer mm -hmm. with things uh, so that you don't look fussy now, if you're working in an egg tempera, I have to say the egg tempera, because of the nature of the meeting, you have to do little small strokes. Mm -hmm. So that would be different. But, uh, um, so there's, there's an exception to the rule there. Generally work with the largest brush you can, as long as you can. Block in, going through the whole painting, or this color for the sky a little bit here, this color for this part of the landscape. And that can be kind of like local color, mm -hmm. in a local value. Mm -hmm. All right? Then you go to the stage where you push and pull that, like um, I want to, this to recede in the picture, uh, let me lighten it a little bit, let me gray it a little bit perhaps, uh, I wanted this to come forward, there's not enough contrast, I need, to, I need to really push out the people here with texture, I need to let it pull in here. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of almost massaging the painting in the push and pull stage. Right. And uh, finally, detail. You know, whatever, find a little line, uh, and that detailing can be taking place while you're pushing and pulling. You know, yeah. There may be some statement you make that you're going to leave it there to the end, and you don't change that anymore. But um, 
so then a very important thing I do, I put the painting away for a few days and uh, and then come back to it and set it up and look to see if there's anything I could do to it to make it better. But if it, I have to fight to do another stroke on that to really, then it's probably baked. So to speak. Okay. it's done. And the final stage is to, to make sure you um, catalog your work, okay. meaning that you photograph it, you title it. Uh, and that's an important thing. A title should be thought of pretty much before you paint. Okay. A good title gives you a theme for what you're doing. Okay. Now you may amorph the title at the end of the, mm. of the piece that you finally discovered. If it's a better title, use the better title. Yeah. You don't have to be that hard headed to just keep the title. But generally you need to have a theme for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Do you title all of your works? I even title if all not? my work. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I've rarely ever had an untitled piece.